hello. ALS is a rather rare disorder uh, as far as some of the other neurologic disorders that we've talked about. However, you will probably see it at some point in your clinical career and you will for sure see it if you're a neurologist. So ALS is a progressive neurologic deterioration and this is the important part of both the upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons. This is what makes it unique. It affects both the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. And so the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis word comes from, that lateral part comes from the fact that it affects the lateral corticospinal tracts, which remember is our motor tract pathway. So this affects both upper motor neurons running down in the spinal cord and it affects the lower motor neurons. So you're gonna get a specific uh, combination of symptoms that you wouldn't see in any other illness because all of the other illnesses we've talked about that affect the motor pathway either affect the upper motor neurons or the lower motor neurons and this one affects both. So this is unique in that way. This disease is absolutely entirely motor so you shouldn't have any sensory symptoms from the ALS. It does have an insidious onset, so patients don't come in and say, I started getting this weakness two days ago. It starts out really, 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 really uh, weak and very, well, that's probably not the best word, really, really faint and just progressively gets worse over uh, a period of months to where the patient finally comes in. And, uh, and when you ask them how long this has been going on, they may not know, they'll say maybe two months, maybe three months, but it definitely won't be a week. There are about 5,600 cases diagnosed in the U.S. every year, so um, not a whole lot, but again, if, if you're going into neurology uh, or working on a neurology floor, something that you'll probably see. And there is no cure for ALS, unfortunately. We treat it uh, supportively. Now, ALS is the, uh, is the medical term for this disease, and it's certainly appropriate when you're talking with medical professionals or writing, uh, writing on notes. However, if you're not from the United States, you may not know that this is commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And when you're talking to patients, you need to refer to it as Lou Gehrig's disease because nobody knows what the heck ALS is. Nobody knows amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, in the general population. So uh, when you're talking to patients, you need to refer to this as Lou Gehrig's disease. And Lou Gehrig was a, uh, a baseball player. So that's, that's where it comes from. Okay, so as I mentioned, it affects both the upper and lower motor neurons, which is very characteristic of this disorder. Some of the symptoms that you would see, that would be upper motor neuron. So remember, some of the upper motor neuron uh, diseases would be like multiple sclerosis. Uh, that would be uh, like primitive reflexes, because remember, it's the upper motor neurons that inhibit those primitive reflexes. So particularly, you're going to see the Babinski reflex. That's the common one that's given on the USMLE, and it's the most known one and the easiest one to, uh, to elicit. All you're doing is you're you're uh, rubbing a, a stick or uh, the back of your reflex hammer up against the side of the, the lateral aspect of the patient's sole, and what you get is uh, the toes extending. Dorsoflexing, as they like to say. Hyperreflexia, uh, that you're going to get pretty much for the same reasons that you get your primitive reflexes. It's the upper motor neurons that keep those reflexes in check, and so if you have damage to your upper motor neurons, you're going to have uh, exaggerated reflexes. Spasticity, hypertonia, a clasp knife reflex. A clasp knife reflex, what that is, is let's say that you've got the patient's fist on their shoulders. So they're, uh, they're flexed at their elbow. And you're trying to, uh, without, without them helping you, you're, you're, gonna try to, uh, you're gonna try to extend their arm so that their fist is towards you. You're gonna pull their fist out towards you. What you're gonna get is you're gonna get a lot of uh, resistance. And, and it's, it's, not, it, it, the, it's not the patient resisting. What it is is it's rigidity. And you're gonna pull and you're gonna pull and you'll get, you'll get it a little further and a little further and then you'll hit a point and it'll come right down. There'll be no resistance. That's the clasp knife reflex. 
The pronator drift is what you do is you have the patient close their eyes and you have their you have them put their palms up towards the sky, close their eyes, and when they close their eyes, what happens is that the palms drift downwards. So that uh, rather than having your hands in supination, your hands are in pronation. So you have a drift towards pronation. Those are all upper motor neuron signs. Lower motor neuron signs are going to be particular to the muscle. So fibrillations, fasciculations, and then uh, lack of tone of the muscle. So hypotonia, and then of course, of course hyporeflexia, because the lower motor neuron is what carries the, uh, the signal to reflex. Now you can see that some of these are opposites, hyperreflexia and hyporeflexia, hypertonia and hypotonia. So certainly you're not going to see all of these at the same time, but if you see fibrillations and hypotonia with spasticity and pronator drift, there you go. You've got upper motor and lower motor neuron symptoms, and that's particular to ALS. So look, for, you, you might not have all of the upper motor neuron and all of the lower motor neuron symptoms all the time, but you'll have a mixture of both. Another thing that you should see in ALS is generalized weakness, particularly to the limb muscles. Most patients uh, present with limb weakness, weakness of their, of their thighs, of their legs, of their arms, and so that's another thing that you'll see on physical exam. In ALS, unlike other neurologic disorders that affect the nerves, bowel and bladder control are preserved, as are extraocular muscles. Those tend to be conserved as well. And the extraocular muscles, uh, those being conserved, is going to be a main way that you're going to differentiate this early on from myasthenia gravis, which can also cause weakness. It tends to be restricted to the extraocular muscles, whereas ALS tends to not affect the extraocular muscles. Cranial nerves can also be involved, so you can have some facial symptoms. So dysarthria can happen due to uh, all of these cranial nerves being affected, uh, and that's because all of these nerves are important for movement of the tongue, of the face, of the pharynx, and all of that is really important for speech. So if you have these nerves being affected, your speech is going to sound unusual. Usually the way it's described is nasally speech. Uh, of course, the vagus nerve is, uh, if, if that's affected, uh, you can get some hoarseness in your speech, again, just because of it innervating uh, the pharynx. And then uh, cranial nerve six, or cranial nerve 10 and 12, uh, if those become affected because it's responsible, they're both responsible for initiating swallowing and uh, progressing swallowing, you can get dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, or even choking. So these are some pretty significant symptoms if they're present. So about 70 to 80 percent of patients will present with uh, the limb, upper motor, and lower motor neuron symptoms, whereas about 10 to 20 percent of patients with ALS will present with more of these cranial symptoms. And then one more symptom that you can see out of ALS is the pseudobulbar affect syndrome. What this is, is it's involuntary laughing or crying. And I'm not talking about if you're sitting in a movie. I'm talking about you could be in a meeting and you're not thinking about anything funny or sad and all of a sudden you just burst out laughing or crying. And obviously that can be something really, really, really troubling to a patient with ALS because it affects their ability to function socially. So this is, uh, this is something that you, you do run into a lot with ALS, and there's a particular way to treat it. And the USMLE does like to ask that, so we'll talk about that later on. So the history in a patient with ALS, uh, a lot of times they have a family history, especially if it's a younger patient presenting with symptoms. So you always want to get a family history and ask if anybody's been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. Don't ask them if anyone's been diagnosed with ALS because they probably won't know what that means. Ask them if anyone's been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. And, um, and if there is a family history, that does uh, make the diagnosis a little bit more likely, especially if they're younger. And of, of course, as I mentioned, often the patients are going to have been having these symptoms present for some time, uh, and they've only just came in. But the symptoms should have lingered and, uh, or have gotten worse. They shouldn't come and go. 
So most patients, about 70 to 80 percent of patients, present with these upper and lower motor neuron complaints related to the limb and gait. So if it's your legs, you see like tripping and stumbling and limp. If it's your hands, especially if you work in a profession where you're doing a lot of writing, like if you're a secretary, for instance, a lot of them get cramping of their hands or hand fatigue, and they can get stiffening of any of their muscles as well, which goes with that hypertonia. Some patients, about 10 to 20 percent, present with this dysarthria, dysphagia, and hoarseness, and then the pseudobulbar affect syndrome. On physical exam, you should note noticeable weakness of the limbs. So noticeable weakness uh, at the feet, at the calves, at the, uh, at the legs, at the arms, shoulders. Uh, it's gonna be more uh, axial weakness than truncal weakness. Uh, you should also see uh, gait abnormalities. That's pretty common just because they have a hard time lifting their legs up properly to walk appropriately. And then the Babinski sign, the, the, the primitive reflexes. Those are very, very, very common and very telling that there's an upper motor neuron process happening. Now, the reduced bulk and nasal speech should be something that you should ask a family member. And it's really helpful to have a family member in for a lot of these neurologic disorders that happen insidiously because a lot of times the patient isn't going to notice it. And you may not notice it, especially if you're not the primary uh, physician for the patient, or even if you are, you might not notice if the patient has had a reduced muscle bulk. Uh, so you can ask the patient, you know, have have you noticed that you've your muscles have shrunk or that your voice has changed? And if they tell you yes, then fine. Uh, but it's a lot of times very difficult for a clinician to look at a patient for the first time and say, oh, she sounds nasally and she's got a reduced muscle bulk because that might just be how they normally are. Uh, but if the patient says that they have any of these or the family member says that any of these are present, uh, then that's notable. You should, uh, of course, ask if any of these are present, but you should never uh, w reduce muscle bulk or nasal speech. You should never really assume any of those unless you know the patient because you're comparing something to the past. Okay, diagnosis, it's clinical. Uh, it's very difficult to diagnose early on in the course, especially if it's just hand cramping or a little bit of tripping. Uh, but once it gets to the point where there's dysarthria as well as tripping and stumbling and cramping, uh, then you're uh, more on to your diagnosis. But the main hints are going to be the fact that you have this coexisting upper and lower motor neuron symptoms and the fact that the course of the disease has been progressive and unrelenting. These patients don't come in and they say, oh, it's better some days and worse other days. No, this has been going on chronically and it's getting worse. Technically, the most accurate way to diagnose ALS is an electromyelogram. And most of the times you're going to need to get this, uh, you're gonna need to get this, this test done to make the diagnosis because ALS is a, it's a deadly disease. So, I mean, I mean, imagine if you're the patient, you want every test done to make sure that you have to prepare for the end of your life. So most patients are going to need to have an EMG done, but not necessarily as much for knowing that it is ALS, um, just more for confirming the diagnosis that we're pretty sure is already there. But the most accurate diagnostic test is an EMG. Um, I should say that's the most accurate diagnostic test while the patient is alive. The, the really, the truly mo the most accurate test um, it would be post-mortem if you got a uh, if you got a section of their spine and stained it, you would notice that you've got uh, pathology of the lateral corticospinal tract. So most accurate test while the patient is alive. Okay, differential diagnosis. Uh, most of these, when the patient is progressed in their ALS, it should be pretty clear that uh, these are not the diagnosis. But early on. ALS can be confused with some of these. So spinal muscle atrophy is only gonna give you lower motor neuron symptoms. That's one giveaway. A lot of times spinal muscle atrophy presents in younger patients, by younger I mean younger than 30, 35 years old, or even in infants. And we never see ALS in, in pediatrics. It's not a disease of pediatrics. Uh, 
family history is pretty much always going to be there, and to diagnose spinal muscle atrophy, there's genetic testing that's available. So spinal muscle atrophy is mostly a disease of younger patients, and it's going to be lower motor neuron symptoms only. So you shouldn't have Babinski. Spinal canal stenosis, because it's a stenosis at a particular level of the spinal cord, it's going to be restricted to particular sensory motor levels. So it, uh, you may get some of that uh, weakness, but you're not going to have it um, in both your arms or your legs. And another thing is because this is stenosis of the spinal canal, not just the lateral corticospinal tract, you can get sensory symptoms as well. And if you ever have sensory symptoms, you should be instantly thinking of something other than ALS. And you also oftentimes will have pain with spinal canal stenosis. For stroke, this is something that's more of an acute onset. ALS is not. Uh, so instantly if the patient says, oh, these symptoms have only been going on for a couple days, you're not thinking ALS. Now stroke is usually pretty, uh, pretty conspicuous with how it comes on. It's usually a pretty dramatic presentation. However, there are lacunar strokes, strokes of the penetrating uh, arteries that can cause some focal neurologic deficits. And so that can result in some weakness in some parts of the body. And so that can be confused with the weakness of ALS. But the most important thing here is that uh, this is an acute onset with stroke, whereas ALS is an insidious onset. And the risk factors for stroke are often going to be present in patients with stroke. They don't necessarily have to be with patients with ALS. And with stroke, it's going to be localized, whereas with ALS, it's going to be more generalized. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a lower motor neuron disorder. It's a, uh, an autoimmune disorder where the myelin is uh, eaten up, and so you've got uh, a slower conduction through the lower motor neurons. This tends to happen in younger patients, but can happen in anybody of any age. It also is an acute onset. It's an ascending paralysis, so this does not start in the arms. This starts in the legs, and on the, U on the USMLE, it will always start in the feet. And so this ascending paralysis does have maybe some gait features like ALS does, but it's going to start in the feet and it's going to work its way up over the course of days up into the legs and to the thighs. What you also see here, because this is a lower motor neuron disorder, is that you're going to have hyporeflexia and areflexia all the time. There have been case reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome with hyperreflexia, but that's that's not going to be how the USMLE presents this. This is a disorder of myelin on the lower motor neuron. So because this is a lower motor neuron disorder, you should see hyporeflexia or areflexia. And another thing is that this is often post-infectious. So if the patient has a history of three or four weeks ago having had an upper respiratory tract disorder or of having a diarrheal disorder, Guillain-Barre syndrome becomes more likely. The way we diagnose Guillain-Barre syndrome, and if any of these symptoms are present uh, and Guillain-Barre syndrome looks like the picture that we've got, you should get a CSF analysis. And with the CSF, you'll see in the fluid that you have an elevated protein, but an absence of cells. And that's typical of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Myasthenia gravis was alluded to earlier. Again, this is also acute onset. It tends to affect the smaller muscles more than the bigger muscles. So it tends to affect the extraocular muscles very frequently and some of the smaller muscles. And that right there differentiates it out from ALS. Acute onset and it affects the extraocular muscles. It also worsens throughout the day and it's better when they wake up in the morning. These patients tend to have a history of autoimmune disorders such as type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, and lupus. Okay, the treatment for ALS is supportive. Unfortunately, we don't have any drugs that can cure ALS. Uh, we don't even hardly have any drugs that uh, increase the life expectancy. We do have one though. ALS is usually fatal within three to five years of onset. The one drug you really, 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 really need to know for ALS is Rilazole. And you should actually just get into the habit of associating the word Rilazole with ALS. Because most of the time when the USMLE gives you a question of a patient with ALS, they won't tell you it's a patient with ALS, but when it's a patient that's got symptoms totally consistent with ALS, 
the answer is going to be Rilosol because they're going to want to know what medication should you give to extend this patient's life. Unfortunately, Rilosol only extends the patient's survival by about six months, but if you're the patient, six months can be a long time if you're told you only have three to five years to live. So that those six months can be, can be the difference for that patient to be able to say goodbye to more loved ones or maybe even being able to do more things that they want to do on their bucket list. So this is important that you know this. Even though six months doesn't seem like a lot to us as physicians, six months is a lot for, for patients, and so we need to rem rem remember that. Rilazole is an NMDA inhibitor, so that gives us maybe a little perspective into some of the uh, mechanisms about ALS that we might not know yet. Muscle spasms and cramps are very common with ALS, so we treat those with muscle relaxants. You can use either baclofen or tizanidine. And then remember that pseudobulbar affect, that inappropriate crying or laughing that comes on randomly? That can be treated with uh, a combination medication of dextromethorphan and quinidine. Yes, that's the same dextromethorphan you use as a cough suppressant. So dextromethorphan, quinidine, it's just put into one medication. Physical therapy can be useful for patients with ALS uh, to reduce the risk of contractures, which can be painful, and contractures have to do with ligaments, so those aren't going to get better with baclofen or tizanidine. So physical therapy is useful to reduce the risk of that happening. You don't want the patients just sitting about doing nothing. You do want them doing appropriate physical activity because it will in improve their quality of life. Now, as the disease progresses, they're going to have a harder time swallowing, harder time talking, harder time eating, and so uh, and a harder time breathing. So what we do later on in the course, you can use anticholinergics, which reduces their saliva uh, formation, and so that will reduce the drooling, which can be obviously pretty embarrassing. We're going to do a peg placement for feeding because they can't swallow, and that's why we're not so much worried about having a, a, a really great amount of saliva because they're going to have problems eating and they can be at a choke risk. We're going to place a feeding tube and that's going to be done percutaneously uh, via endoscopy. And a PEG tube is just a tube that's placed right into the stomach and you've got nutrition going into the tube. And it's really, really easy. You can have it done as an outpatient procedure. Uh, either a surgeon or a gastroenterologist can do it. They just go in the same way they would do an upper endoscopy. They shine their little LED light uh, once they get into the stomach. They know they're in the stomach with the camera. And then they make the incision and place the tube. Uh, and then non-invasive ventilatory support is often useful later on in the course because they do start to develop respiratory muscle weakness. And I should have put this maybe towards the top, but palliative care consultation, uh, in addition to neurology, of course, is going to be useful for patients with ALS, because, uh, just as in any patient who have terminal diseases, because they're the pros at, at sort of managing their grief and managing uh, some of the, the depression they may come along with it, and some of the uh, end-of-life planning and things like that. The uh, usual cause of death from ALS is aspiration pneumonia, but there are other causes as well. And as always, with any patient with, uh, with a terminal disease, you should talk to them about their code status, and uh, particularly do not intubate because a lot of times that's, that would be a way to keep a patient with ALS alive if they don't want to be kept alive. Certainly, they have the mental cognition to make that decision. Patients with ALS are not uh, dysfunctional mentally. They're totally in cap. So, uh, so, so you, should, um, you should definitely negotiate their, uh, not negotiate, but uh, ask them about their code status and do not intubate status uh, so that, that can be set aside when the time comes. And certainly you shouldn't put this in their face right away. It's really important with ALS uh, that you give the patient space to grieve because this is a uh, terminal diagnosis and um, it should be uh, treated respectfully. Of course, in the United States, there's a lot of discomfort with talking about terminal illness. It's not necessarily the case in other countries, uh, but here uh, it is uh, met with a lot of grief and a lot of uh, denial.
and uh, and and uh, so very important to give the patient that process. And that's another reason why having palliative care consulted right away is good for both for you dealing with it as the clinician and for the patient dealing with it as the victim of this unfortunate disease. And that's all I've got for you.